Hello, everybody. Welcome, greetings. And welcome to the uh, second day of the 2023 Tanner Lectures on Human Values, featuring Margaret Redsteer on the topic of climate futures and structural paradigms. The title of her second lecture today is Barrier to Transforming Climate Dialogues. Uh, in a minute, I will invite Professor Joseph Gahn to the stage to offer some reflections on Margaret Redsteer's first lecture and to introduce today's respondent, uh, Rebecca Tsotsi. Uh, uh, but first, let me say a few words about the vision of the Tanner Lectures on Human Values. Um, uh, we heard a little bit from uh, President Bacow yesterday about these, uh, so I'm giving some effort to saying something a little bit different uh, to give more context on them. And that is that the tenor lectures were established by the American scholar, industrialist, and philanthropist, Obert Clark Tanner. Um, and you mentioned, Margaret, in your story yesterday about uh, silversmithing. And so I thought I would mention that Obert Tanner made his fortune on class rings for high school uh, and college. Uh, and to this day, uh, the company that he founded in 1927, when he was 23 years old, uh, is an employee recognition company. Uh, Obert Tanner was also a professor at the University of Utah in philosophy, focusing on religion. Perhaps he made less fortune in that arena. Um, but he did specialize uh, on the teachings in the New Testament and claimed that it gave him compassion for human suffering and an unyielding hope for an eventual human felicity. Uh, he also claims to have taken from Socrates the idea that the unexamined life is not worth living. And what, meanwhile, his wife Grace favored the study of science, notably biology and anthropology. And thus, when uh, endowing the lectures, the Tanner lectureships, uh, he had in mind a future of speakers who would reflect on the intellectual and moral life of humankind and would pursue a better understanding of human behavior and human values. Indeed, this is a pursuit. Uh, if history has taught us anything, it is that human values especially need constant re-examination. While we might intuit that it's easy to agree on a definition that human values are, say, those virtues that guide us and how we ought to interact with one another, that is, how we ought to show consideration, appreciation, sympathy, empathy, listening, respect, openness towards one another. It is clear that the to whom and by whom in the equation of expression of human values needs a lot more attention. And that is for both today's world and alas in history. So Margaret Redsteer, your lecture yesterday illustrated what scientific research on climate change can look like when, if you'll allow me to borrow an expression from geology, when human values are the bedrock of scientific endeavor. So I look forward to your lecture today, and it has been a great pleasure getting to know you this week, and I look forward to uh, tomorrow as well. So I would like to thank members of the Tanner um, Committee for the good wisdom in selecting Margaret Redsteer as Harvard's 2023 Tanner Lecturer. The members of the uh, committee were uh, Nyen He Xia, Gina Kim, Hisa Kuriyama, Kenneth Mack, Martha Minow, Charlie Stang, and Robert Reed Farr. I'd also like to thank, as ever, the wonderful staff at the Mahindra Humanity Center as well as the staff at the president's office and the music department. And I'm also grateful to Mark Matheson, the director of the Tanner Lectures. And now I'm going to uh, turn things over to uh, Joseph Gahn, uh, who is the professor of anthropology in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and of Global Health and Social Medicine in the Harvard Medical School. He's also faculty director uh, of the Harvard University Native American program. Prior to joining Harvard in 2018, he was professor of psychology and American culture at the University of Michigan, where he also served as director of Native American studies. 
Professor Gan is a scholar renowned for his partnerships with indigenous communities and for reimagining community-based mental health services that champion traditional culture and spirituality for advancing indigenous well-being. As the author of well over 80 scholarly publications and numerous commissioned reports on, reports on best practices in psychology, Joe has been the recipient of awards at the, every step of his career, notably from the American Psychological Association for, and these are all separate awards, distinguished service for community research and action, for significant contributions to Native and Indigenous psychology. And in, 19, in 2019, he was honored with the APA's Distinguished Career Award. He is en an enrolled member uh, of the Aani uh, Gross Vont Tribal Nation of Montana. So please, Montana. So please join me in welcoming Joe Gon to the stage. Thank you. Everyone. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that um, warm introduction and pleased for the opportunity to welcome and orient us to today's event. As you heard, I'm a professor of anthropology and of global health and social medicine here at Harvard. I'm a 1992 alum of Harvard College. I'm an enrolled citizen of the Aani Grovant Tribal Nation of Montana at Fort Belknap, and I'm the faculty director of the Harvard University Native American Program. As an interfaculty initiative of Harvard University, HUNAP's mission is fourfold. We pursue education, community, scholarship, and inclusion. And today's event achieves all of these goals, perhaps especially scholarly inclusion. In particular, we're uh, very dedicated and committed to expanding the presence, visibility, and impact of persons of Native American and indigenous descent on campus in a wide variety of roles. And so it's really a pleasure to welcome Professor Margaret Redsteer to talk to us again today in these Tanner Lectures on Human Values with a title and topic of climate futures and structural paradigms. Professor Red Steer is a faculty member in interdisciplinary arts and sciences at the University of Washington Bothell campus. She has a BS in geology, an MS in sedimentology, a PhD in trace element geochemistry in the geosciences, and she's been a prior research scientist for the US Department of Interior and the US Geological Survey. She continues to research landscape processes, including erosion by wind and water, and how changing vegetation, communities, and climate can influence these processes and exacerbate geologic hazards. She possesses an amazing breadth of scholarly expertise, including in geomorphologic mapping, sediment sampling, seasonal vegetation surveys, meteorological monitoring, and also in land use history and policy, as she illustrated for us yesterday. Additionally, she's a member of the Absaroka people, a citizen of the Crow tribe of Montana, and she inquires into indigenous knowledge held by tribal elders for her research. Yesterday's lecture was titled On Resilience, a Capacity to Absorb Disturbances and Shocks, and it detailed a multidisciplinary analysis from her work with the Navajo Diné people in the American Southwest as they continue to adapt to changing climate conditions. She engaged us in at least four issues, the Diné legacies of both agricultural and pastoralism, particularly sheep herding, the impacts of colonial subjugation and federal Indian policy on these ways of life over time, the compression of Diné people into smaller and less sustainable areas over time, and the integration of indigenous accounts and scientific data to arrive at a more complete narrative of climate change in the Navajo Nation. Illuminating these remarks was a terrific response by Professor Clint Carroll, a Cherokee scholar from University of Colorado at Boulder, who set the stage for really an audience exchange that was quite interesting. I think two issues that I'll point out from that exchange were questions surrounding the meaning and relevance of the term resilience when applied to indigenous strategies of adaptation, and the benefits and prospects of indigenous knowledges for broader global understanding of these issues. Today's lecture is entitled Barriers, into Trans Barriers to Transforming Climate Dialogues, and I'm also really fortunate to welcome another accomplished respondent this afternoon. That's Professor Rebecca Sosi. Professor Sosi is Regents Professor at the James E. Rogers College of Law at the University of Arizona, where she's a faculty member for the Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program at UA, 
She's a former Regents Professor and Vice Provost for Inclusion and Community Engagement at Arizona State University, where she was the first Faculty Executive Director for ASU's Indian Legal Program. Of Yaki descent, she has published widely on sovereignty, self-determination, cultural pluralism, environmental policy, and cultural rights. So we're really going to be treated today to some wonderful remarks, and with that, I'd like to invite uh, Professor Red Steer to the stage. Please join me in welcome her. Hello, it's great to see everybody this afternoon. And thank you for those wonderful opening remarks that really helps to set the stage for today. And um, as we talked about yesterday, we talked about how climate change impacts are occurring and are gonna continue to occur. And there was a question from a person in the audience who mentioned that most people are concerned with sea level rise but I was talking a lot about drought, heat waves, and aridity. So we had a little bit of a discussion about where you are and what you experience um, makes you think about what kind of climate impacts you might expect to see. But when I moved to the University of Washington in Bothell, I never expected that we would have summer heat waves of 110 degrees and that the heat would be even greater in British Columbia um, and that millions of uh, literal uh, clams and other coastal sea creatures would succumb to the, the temperatures. So one of the big challenges we have with climate change is that the climate we face in the future won't resemble the past. And that's one of the biggest barriers we have to really imagining how to plan and think about what we do to respond to climate change. It is by far one of the biggest challenges, that and the fact that we really do need to be talking to each other about these challenges. And so when you think about these different kinds of climate impacts, you might not imagine what could happen. I mean, there could be droughts here too um, with increasing aridity and higher temperatures. And we're gonna all have to address them together. But that's gonna require working together to communicate and to raise awareness and to enact corresponding changes with as much information as we can gather. Although that information will never be complete. At the same time, though, there are barriers to climate change adaptation that reduce the space for access to decision-making and resources. And breaking down these barriers are gonna be required because we need a lot of flexibility and innovation because it's gonna be very hard to really understand what our climate futures pretend. There will always be inevitable surprises so the framing of climate dialogues into future risks inherent in climate models, while necessary, can also allow for inaction because you're always thinking of climate as something off in the future. But this can be balanced by local knowledge accounts that are relatable on tame scales familiar in human experiences as people observe the changes they are seeing. So local knowledge, local indigenous knowledge allows for a dialogue that includes changes to living conditions that are more uh, broad than sectoral approaches. In contrast, what we have currently as climate policy is a mainstreaming of climate action. And that means adding climate change consideration into the existing sectors or programs that exist today. So, Whatever the agency goals are, those are the goals that are being maintained. And these favor those with privileges and connections and ignores the different ways that climate 
could be experienced and where loss and damages could be most severe. And this can lead to magnified inequality. So a true participatory justice framework for climate action should include a recognition of past inequities, human rights and laws, but it's also going to require a, po a comprehensive policy with clear goals to build socioeconomic and adaptive capacity. And by adaptive capacity, I mean the ability to shape and create the change we would want for our future. Indigenous knowledge frameworks place importance on the power of words and how information is part, that is imparted shapes our thinking. And words have been used effectively to influence the way we, we see Native people and how Native people have been perceived historically and the history of colonial conquest the scholars are now revisiting. Words also matter in the ways we think about the challenges of climate change today. Passing information to each other through stories is an indigenous communication method and a human way of connecting that scientists are embracing to communicate their work. Still, it can be difficult to talk openly about climate change in communities where words are known to have significant influence on thought and action. People don't like to talk about problems. Discussing climate hazards has also been difficult because native communities are already fo uh, facing a great many challenges. And adding to the list is not a popular stance to take. I've come to think that this is also an important lesson though that native worldviews provide, an understanding of human psychology and human nature. Rather than proclaiming the coming apocalypse, thinking about what can be done to bring to get people together to collectively would be a more traditional native approach. I think people are actually looking for ways they can do this and come together to address climate change. But to do this, we do have barriers that we face that lead to inaction and ineffective policies. In discussing how structures we inhabit shape our action or inaction, it may be useful for me to share a recent experience I had in co-authoring a paper with federal scientists. In exchanging edits, I found that when climate change was mentioned, it was consistently portrayed as something happening in the future. The verb tenses were continually used, even though the focus of the publication was an examination of how climate change was already influencing landscape conditions. My attempts to change the phrasing of the tense from will happen to is happening were rebuffed <laughs> with an explanation that the journal, sub journal submission would likely be flagged for more intense scrutiny by the internal federal review process. Scientists working in the federal government can be under intense pressure when providing information to the public. And they're limited and controlled by bureaucratic checks that appear benign, but strongly affect the choices that scientists make and how climate change ultimately then is portrayed. Still, climate research mostly focuses on projections of what might happen in 30, 50, or 100 years from now, or conversely, the record of changes that occurred during climatic fluctuations hundreds to thousands of years ago. These are important, though hard to communicate studies that are not easily relatable to current human experiences. In contrast, observations from indigenous peoples, lands, and resources show a vast array of climate impacts and living conditions on decadal timescales. And these observations are a significant contribution to the understanding of our world today. Observations about ecosystem changes already underway through indigenous knowledge has the potential to raise local awareness about impacts among a broader public. It can also inform the approaches to adaptation generally as more and more communities begin to grapple with climate change impacts. The usage of traditional knowledge is not new. Developments in science from the 1600s and 1700s during European colonial expansion relied on local experts to identify species of interest. They also adopted from indigenous peoples entire classification schemes that order and interpret ecological systems, as well as the names of birds, fish, edible, and medicinal plants. In this manner, Western taxonomic knowledge and practice were significantly transformed by their encounter with traditional systems of knowledge and meaning during the colonial era. European conceptions of Asian botany 
as Ellen and Harris point out, ironically depended upon a set of practices that which represented as Western science had been derived from earlier codifications of indigenous knowledge." End quote. During colonization, Western scientific understandings were brought about by the appropriation of traditional ecological knowledge with little acknowledgement of its intellectual origins. And there are many examples now, though, that show we can do a better job at combining different forms of knowledge and working towards meaningful goals. The pairing of indigenous knowledge as contrib contributions to scientific analysis are referred to as knowledge co-production. And it's been common in the Arctic, but it has also been used in African nations, Australia, South and Central America, the Asia Pacific and South Asia, including India and Tibet. The co-production of knowledge was first accredited in a 1990s wildlife co-management effort to communicate perspectives from both Diné people and biologists working up, looking at caribou migration. The work to promote wildlife availability in Alaska and Canada demonstrated the value of understanding a place and its ecosystem at an intimate level. These studies also demonstrate that conventional measurements have limitations in understanding complex systems that can be overcome by longer and more integrated human observations about a particular place. Observations of place are also tied to language as terms are needed to describe the nuances and attributes of a specific environment. An example of language tied to tradi traditional knowledge comes from the efforts to preserve Inupiaq and Yupik terms as taxonomic descriptions of sea ice that can be used to understand how climate and sea ice interact. And Igor Krupnik's work really does a great job of summarizing these efforts. The root of the taxonomies themselves are based on the need to have detailed knowledge about local environments in order to survive, hunt, and gather plants. But the languages which are, co are localized in indigenous communities are tuned into the local changes that are not necessarily the same things that you would describe in another culture in another place. So while no knowledge co-production has contributed much to science, Differentials of power still remain among research participants. Politics and power play a role in how local knowledge is framed and whose development outcomes are prioritized. Colonial worldviews in research, policy, and practice can limit the role of local knowledge to inform the ways in which it's applied to climate change and other challenges that communities wish to confront. Romanticization of native people can also be perpetuated by the notion of an ecological only framing where native people are not likely to have a role in asking the science questions, but rather become points of, for data collection as other plants and animals might. These challenges need to be recognized so that efforts can counter the influences over how different forms of knowledge are in, and information are acquired, applied, and credited. And people on reservations usually don't talk about indigenous knowledge or TEK, although I think that's beginning to change. Knowledge simply guides people in innumerable interactions with an ever-changing environment. Local knowledge reflects lived experience for a particular society and is geographically placed within a landscape and all of its complicating attributes. The local knowledge in one particular family group or area is likely to differ from the local knowledge in another, even within the same culture or region, due to the heterogeneities of landscapes and differences in cultural expertise. An example might be whether a person is knowledgeable about a spring and the family that utilizes that spring and the types of plants and animals associated with it. But it would also necessarily include the other families and kinship relationships that customarily share that access and whether that access has changed due to drought or other unforeseeable consequences. So how the aspects of spring use are negotiated may also be informed by intergenerational teachings. Traditional knowledge is differentiated from local knowledge through these intergenerational teachings about how to live well and stories that communicate ethical frameworks and philosophies combined within a social, political, and moral holistic framework. <clears throat> 
These frameworks of knowledge are focused on the well-being of the community and the flourishing of families by providing food security from hunting, fishing, gathering, pastoralism, small-scale agriculture, but also health care, clothing, shelter, and strategies for coping with environmental fluctuations or external forces, forces of change. So indigenous ways of thinking and living have general similarities in ethical framing, while knowledge systems can be as diverse and complex as the places where they occur. This is part of the reason we should think more about how to value expertise. The lexicon of definitions for local and indigenous knowledge is long and often repeated when the topic of indigenous lifeways arises. The terms indigenous, traditional, or local knowledge refer to knowledge and know-how accumulated across generations. And in some cases, there are also examines, uh, examples of deep time knowledge, such as the example of pre-Columbian travel route descriptions in ceremonial songs described by Kelly and Francis. Traditional ecological knowledge has been defined as a cumulative body of knowledge, practice, and belief evolving by adaptive processes handed down through generations by cultural transmission about the relationship of living beings, including humans, and their environment. This off-sided definition by Burks is often seen as a process of, as a, as a describing a process of adaptive management for conservation with humans taking more than giving and working with one another. And as a geoscientist, I'd also like to add, <laughs> because I have to as a geoscientist, um, that aspects of local and traditional knowledge also include astronomical observations tied to ceremonies and other seasonal events, as well as the utilization of geologic, geomorphologic, and hydrologic conditions. But as most of us in the earth sciences know, that a textbook is a poor substitute for being on the landscape and making firsthand observations, and what we put in the notebook does not reflect the entirety of what we see, no matter how much effort we may put into the data we collect, the focus of our attention is gonna depend on the questions we seek to answer. So what if the goal of our observation, years of observations were to improve community well-being and to support the lands and all of the relations that we rely upon? These environmental ethics aspects of traditional knowledge could be a mechanism to deliver the needed opportunities for cooperative and respective dialogues. Dispossession of lands and resources that Native people are connected to and the roles of these lands in historical adaptations are acknowledged in discourses of Native American history and in law. And for Native communities, the recognition of sacred places as unique assets to restore, repair, and promote cultural and biological diversity should be paired with bolstering additional community-led efforts. Human rights, sovereignty, and cultural rights should be central to supporting the people-ecosystem relationship that we all rely upon in an era of a changing climate. However, human landscape interactions are heavily influenced by the policies that are already in place and whether we react to preserve or have forward-looking vision. The conventional ecosystem-based framing of traditional knowledge has been accepted as useful for resource-based programs, prioritizing the dominant existing sectoral approaches. But this stance is confounding for those of us who have worked to include traditional and cultural connections to ceded lands. A second experience to highlight here is the connection of more than a dozen tribes to the San Francisco peaks in northern Arizona and their objection to artificial snowmaking in an, era where, in an area where medicinal plants are collected. The San Francisco peaks are an important site for climate scientists and for adaptation planning because it represents a unique ecosystem with the highest elevation habitats in Arizona and correspondingly rare and unique species. The San Francisco peaks is also an important cultural site to tribes in the Southwest, including the Navajo Nation, the Hav the Hopi tribe, the Havasupai tribe, the Wallapai tribe, the Yavapai Apache nation, and the White Mountain Apache nation. Designated as traditional cultural property under the National Historic Preservation Act, the peaks represent a vital cultural resource that is, is at risk from climate change. And the discussion that I've included here on the San Francisco peaks was deleted 
from a technical report that, um, that Rebecca and I actually worked on to submit to the National Climate Assessment in 2013. Low latitude, high elevation ski resorts, such as the Arizona Snow Bowl on the San Francisco Speaks, Peaks, have experienced declining snowfall and see snowmaking as a solution because without sufficient snow snowpack, the resort was only open for one, in every, one season out of every five years between 1985 and 2010. The solution to decreasing snowfall for recreational business and tourism, albeit temporary given the implications of long-term climate change, um, was to, to um, use sewage effluent to make snow. And legal battles over the use of this sacred site had already started in 1979 when the U.S. Forest Service planned to engage, a plan, uh, planned to engage uh, and expand the ski resort on the San Francisco peaks. But then conflicts began to grow because of the plans to produce snow with sewage effluent. The last court challenge was by the Hopi tribe versus the Arizona Snow Bowl Resort in 2018. Because skiing recreation is seen as economically favorable for the city of Flagstaff, artificial snowmaking is highly unlikely to see future challenges. However, it's not clear that this action will lead to a planning, planning a future when the area is too warm for skiing to continue. Yet native people who desire to protect the environmental integrity of this sacred area will continue to be secondary despite long-standing protests and a history of court challenges to the policy. At some point, it's likely that climate change impacts on the San Francisco peaks might be revisited. And management of the peaks falls under the U.S. Forest Service and its multiple use mandate to accommodate aesthetic, recreational, and commercial uses. But as Sosi points out, like all federal agencies, the Forest Service also has an obligation to discharge the trust responsibility to the many Indian tribes with historic ties and ongoing cultural practices associated with this sacred area. Working towards a plan to protect the area would benefit from an open and inclusive dialogue that considers the diversity of cultures and peoples who are connected to it. And scientific engagement will require that there is additional examination of land use history and the history of federal policy. This is an example of how the sectoral approach of mainstreaming climate change into existing federal programs allows for less friction to accommodate climate change adaptation. However, this can lead to significant policy failures for those who are never a priority for existing programs to begin with. Those who the existing programs serve best, the well-connected, will engage in maintaining existing program structures and work to keep them operating to avoid climate disruptions. It's also likely to incentivize doubling down on systems that increase susceptibility to climate impacts for some while protecting others. Under a mainstreaming only policy, inequality is likely to become more pronounced when adaptation policies overlook growing vulnerabilities of marginalized people who have fallen through the gaps or the unmet needs that don't fit into existing program objectives. The result of mainstreaming climate adaptation into different agencies and sectors is there's no space for alternative methodologies to take root and develop or to avoid efforts that work at cross purposes. Addressing climate change impacts has been primarily reactive as well by tackling problems and land use reforms that already need, are already needed to keep systems operating. Working within this paradigm requires weighing competing rather than working towards a collective vision. While there's now an executive order mandating that traditional knowledge be considered in climate adaptation, it's not likely to be applied consistently without a proactive vision. For traditional knowledge, the emphasis is on utilization of resources and practices for DOI-funded conservation or restoration programs as agency goals. And in contrast, those advancing internationally in fields of adaptation and wildlife ecology understand these phrases themselves to hold mess, less meaning in an era of climate change and are working to maintain resilience rather than to preserve. A good example of this is the World Wildlife Fund who have 
began to take conservation and preservation out of all of their wildlife programs. In general, most attention has focused on how this knowledge includes observations about ecological conditions and subsistence practices. And these, focus, these are focused on what is the done aspect of local knowledge rather than the where or why. Transferring local knowledge practices of the past to the present is aimed at undoing the science and control of nature paradigm that has proven to have unintended and ruinous outcomes in resource, environmental, and disaster management. But the current ways that traditional knowledge is discussed as a tool for climate information and as a data for a spreadsheet or input for an algorithm underestimates the importance of cultural and historical perspective in the significance of the information imparted. As such, I argue these practices removed from their cultural context are not traditional knowledge because the end goal has radically changed to extracting reductionist information for uniform applications. Rather than practices held within a framework of reciprocity and distribution for well-being to community members who co-evolve as part of the environment, climate change and other modern problems are managed in the utilization of resources to bring about the maximum return for consumers. As scientists and sometimes young indigenous scholars themselves are now eliciting transferal of biophysical aspects of this knowledge without the traditional ethic, ethical context, it may be intended as a bridge between different adaptation stakeholders. However, traditional ethics are needed to counter the roots of the history of marginalization and the exploitation of people, their land, and their knowledge. While recent work is important for establishing the loss and damage to environments, journal publications usually don't allow for the inclusion of context. In fact, it's hard to get traditional knowledge um, published in science journals as it is. Sometimes the context is intentionally left out to protect an area, the knowledge holders, and cultural assets. And as a result, adopting procedures as aspects of local knowledge can potentially neglect an understanding of place and time where the practices were learned and proven effective. While we prepare for, prepare for the future using past experiences, we're employing a paradigm that it is aimed at a, the maintenance of the status quo. And this ignores the fact that our climate futures will be different. What we're learning from traditional knowledge holders about weather patterns and climatic conditions is that indigenous peoples in many parts of the world have reported substantial changes. And indigenous observations have included dramatic and pervasive change to seasons, moisture availability, and the altered predictability of weather patterns. While some climate scientists have been hard pressed to produce cooperative scientific data, there are many reasons for the disparity. What a person does on the landscape, such as collecting plants, utilizing springs, or hunting deer will influence what they notice. Averages and totals of precipitation are not necessarily equivalent to the timing, duration, and seasonality of events, and how a particular landscape sediment, soil, rocks, and plants may interact with rainfall, snowfall, or ice. Additional problems arise when weather observations are not available at all in the vicinity of some communities, and topographic variability over an area leads to more localized conditions. One of the most significant aspects of these observations is the shifting of seasons, often including changes of wind energy and direction, and in the unpredictability of weather. These observations come from the Arctic, from tropical rainforests, from Pacific islands, from deserts, and from mountainous regions, and should be alarming in their own right. In response to the growing evidence of human-induced atmospheric warming, reported by James Hansen and others in the 1980s, policy is now informed by governmental climate assessments that are driven by risk-based framing. And these are underpinned by projection modeling and scenarios about the future path pathways that our societies might choose to take. The U.S. National Climate Assessment was mandated by Congress by part of the U.S. Global Change Research Act of 1990 and is part of the Federal Global Change Research Program that also funds climate science. The report findings themselves from both the chapter on urban environments and on climate adaptation are that marginalized populations may also be affected disproportionately by actions to address the underlying causes and impacts of climate change if they are not implemented under policies that consider existing inequalities. 
While similar findings were not highlighted by the Indigenous Peoples Chapter, it's important to discuss them here. First, there are large, unmonitored areas of reservation lands that make studying or planning for climate impacts a significant challenge. Secondly, there's a lack of resources and funding for tribes to commit to climate-based research and expertise to gather data on native lands. And because there are fewer scientists involved in publishing papers about climate change in native communities, the relative certainty about impacts in these areas remains correspondingly lower. Third, programs are needed to assist people on the ground to build the necessary adaptive capacity for climate emergencies. And additionally, supporting institutions such as the Indian Health Service, which has been chronically underfunded and unable to meet the general healthcare needs, will be increasingly necessary and increasingly burdened by the growing threats from climate change. There's currently no accounting for people in native communities who are likely to experience heat exhaustion. Some of the poorest who are the elderly also live through summer heat waves and have no electricity or air conditioning or limited access to potable water. And this is one of the many ways that vulnerable people are affected by more frequent heat-related events. Because different aspects of this problem, though, can fall under different sectors, coordination and accountability becomes really complicated. As is, as is even the collection of data. And who would collect it? <laughs> the amount of work required for climate adaptation in native communities is likely to grow over time. As more and more of the most climate-affected areas succumb to sea level rise, heat waves, droughts, flooding, and erosion. And in Alaska, numerous communities must also contend with rapidly melting permafrost and changing stream erosion and sedimentation during periods of rapid ice melt. The limited ability to gather new data without a science workforce in these and other communities makes it impossible to create informed solutions. Still, many tribal communities will need to make decisions about relocation or managed retreat efforts. As a 2019 Denali Commission study reported, an additional challenge, and this is a quote, an additional challenge is that for community members to obtain the needed information and data, they must possess a certain level of community planning, engineering, economic, and legal knowledge to coordinate and communicate effectively on the state and federal level. This is a great professional leap from the traditional roles that community members typically have, such as fishers, hunters, paraprofessionals, and small-scale business owners. Inexperience also makes communities more vulnerable to inequitable contracts and cons with consultants and contractors needed for their expertise on projects." End quote. As I can attest to, as an experience, as having gone through a relocation experience myself on the Navajo Nation, these things can, even when planned for, be traumatic, culturally damaging, expensive, and divisive to community cohesiveness. Cultural and ethnic, ethical and economic factors should be considered in addition to the environmental and ecological concerns. The needs for consideration for the rights of indigenous people to pre prior, prior and informed consent under these growing challenges could not be more evident. And in an era of climate futures, we can no longer look at a problem or a question through the separate lenses of natural resources, ecology, health, and economy. We need to adopt a more holistic approach and provide for native communities so that we can learn from their successes with a shared ethical vision for the future. Although there's a lack of information and science data is needed, Alaskan villagers and other reservation-based programs are tasked with monumental choices and can only apply for small, narrowly focused grants due to the stovepipe effect of mainstreaming climate policies. The small BIA Climate Resilience Office handed with this task has provided assistance to numerous communities. Nevertheless, it ekes out its existence in a federal bureau that is chronically abysmal, has chronical, chronically abysmal funding to provide grants for climate change adaptation projects. It therefore relies heavily on volunteers to review applications for adaptation funding, and the work focuses primarily on resource management, while the health and living conditions of people who reside in these areas is rarely addressed or only obliquely through cultural connections to natural resources. This reflects mainstreaming policy within individual agencies who work under existing programs and mandates, such as the BIA focus on trust 
managing trust assets rather than an overarching federal policy that could be aimed at the well-being of society through a coherent strategic objective. Diverse views and community expertise are needed to inform what is required. And local knowledge structures with conventional science could be used together in local knowledge co-production if the resources were available. Many of the people involved in efforts to evaluate programs instead will defer when they can to those who identify as native as an antidote. And deference to native people and tribal employees is perceived as listening to those who are vulnerable, who are likely to understand and respond to local resource needs. However, there are many power dynamics in tribal communities just as everywhere else. And native people may not know much about an isolated community from one of a numerous other tribes that are out there. As we know, there are 574 right now, federally recognized tribes, and many others. As Olofemi Otaiwo has articulated in his book, Elite Capture, the difference between situational and identity epistemologies is critical to the reinforcement of what he has described as elite capture. It's hard to recognize that in these circumstances, the marginalized from these communities may not necessarily have been included by instead turning to race-based deferential treatment to those with connections. While the problem is difficult to remedy, it should be recognized and efforts should be made to allow for communication, especially from genders and age groups that have been sidelined in localities that are now facing significant climate impacts. In some cases, the privileged may actually have their own interests in the fate of resource priorities and sometimes have incentives to use their system, the system to their advantage. So, you know, climate adaptation plans can include things like cattle ranchers getting adaptation funding for meteorological monitoring on lands that they lease from the tribal members while the tribal members themselves have no information about the data, the, the local weather data. So to keep chronically under, to keep, to keep these things operating in a way that's equitable requires that we think about who's situated where and, and what, their, um, what their perspectives might be. And then there are the chronically underfunded programs operating, which is typical of Indian country, but many other places as well. Mainstreaming climate change cons considerations into existing programs can lead to what ha some have dubbed the garbage can effect where every problem is tied to an ag a climate agenda. Significant issues can be disregarded from adaptation plans when a small office is already short on resources to keep their programs funded and operating. Climate change becomes the new buzzword to add to existing program funding proposals in order to make up the shortfall. The resulting actions can be seen as local ways to address climate change impacts but provide, funding for, but provide funding for office assistance and ignore structural and systemic processes that are frequently linked to inequities, emerging issues, and those that are most susceptible to climate-induced risks. Although tribal governments have freely elected leaders, the systems that put them in power as domestic dependent sovereigns did so to produce institutions that would give approval to lease extraction of natural resources. And as such, federal programs that fund them and hold the purse strings have an enormous influence over what tribal governments can do and where they focus their resources. Only when a significant change in a national program or policy occurs is there any likelihood of changing a tribal policy or establishing a new tribal office. One such example brought about the formation of CERT, Council of Energy Resource Tribes, in the 1970s. Coal mining plans were negotiated during a development of, policy of po a development of a policy of energy independence after the 1973-74 oil embargo. And so there was an opportunity to negotiate from a position of relative increased power for the tribes. And they, um, they sorely needed cash and royalties and did what they can to leverage their power. Coal, oil, and natural gas revenues have funded these tribal governments since then and aided in self-determination. 
At the time, tribal leaders did what they could to navigate around pressures from the Bureau of Indian Affairs for better terms on mineral leases. And before I went to college, I lived on reservations where coal mining was by far the best job a person could hope for in terms of pay and benefits. These jobs are valued for many reasons, and the lease revenues are still tied to the struggle for sovereignty and economic independence. Tribes in the Great Plains and Southwest have exercised their power effectively against the BIA, but had been entrapped by their roles to implement what the federal government decided they would accept as resource management of their lands. Tribes have had few other options or financial resources for reservation popu populations that live in extreme poverty. But fossil fuel extraction hasn't resulted in the social investments that communities need, and those who have still unproven water rights have an even more uphill battle challenge in challenges to improve socioeconomic conditions and adapt to climate change. There were idealistic views about addressing economic oppression when CERT was formed, and tribes joined forces to take advantage of the leverage that they had. But we now know that the price has been exceptionally high. Decisions about who could live where were based on the need to relocate people for mining and oil and gas exploration. So people were forced off their homes and lands because of the desire to build an economy founded on fossil fuels. Similar problems could arise with, as a new electric grid is built. These relocations were done intentionally through negotiated settlements. Although the Navajo Resettlement, Resettlement Act that I'm personally aware of uh, the consequences from um, was passed by Congress and not supported by the Navajo Nation. However, its intent was to separate the Navajo and Hopi tribal interests to reduce conflict over mineral leases. And because we were living in the joint use area, as it was called, resettlement was mandated to divvy up fossil fuel resources and ensure that each tribe received its own royalties. My personal relocation experience makes me especially aware of the legacy of federal policies and how they're implemented. And because of where we lived, my children will never have a reservation home. Still, it is concerning that the official climate change adaptation plans don't consider accommodations for the increased population density that resulted from redrawing reservation boundaries and the lack of water and drought assistance to the people living in relocated affected areas. Because different policy enactments fall under different institutions, no adaptation plan has mandated the Bennett Freeze area where infrastructure improvement and development was illegal for 40 years would be included in any adaptation plan. What was resulted from the policy and law enactments to divide the Navajo and Hopi and Paiute lands is possibly instead a permanent division between tribal governments that once cooperated when the circumstances required it. In, 19, in 2023, the Build Back Better legislation allocated $135 million uh, for tribes in the Pacific Northwest and Alaska to begin to plan for relocation efforts due to the effects of climate change. And in my experience, as well as other documented accounts, this process, now seen as the best solution for climate change, has long-lasting effects on Native people and communities. Today, there's continuing language around the economic necessity of fuel revenues as well to maintain tribal governments from the Great Plains and the Southwest and for economic growth of communities such as the North Slope of Alaska. While a major coal-fired power plant has closed on the Navajo Nation due to its age, others continue to operate for now. And mining operations have changed ownership to the Navajo Nation for export of coal overseas. Energy development helped define a sense of self-determination in the 70s, but this history also deeply divides generations and communities. Fossil fuel extraction continues to be heralded as the vital resource for jobs and opportunities though some question why this choice is the only option put forward. There are environmental groups with tribal affiliations that protest fossil fuel extraction, but they have been and are still seen as aligning with outside agitators and those with mixed ancestry. Efforts to include climate science and data co-production with outside experts could also add fuel to community divisions if not part of a more comprehensive effort. As growing climate change impacts occur, there will be a need 
for scientific work in the communities affected to inform the choices that will be made, and additional actions pertaining to traditional knowledge from the Biden administration requiring tribal leader permissions for knowledge exchange is likely to curtail dialogues from community members who may be um, opposed to tribally sanctioned developments for cultural reasons. The uneven treatment of knowledge means that it may be necessary to verify that local observations have meaning and conventional science is broadly accepted and published, whereas local knowledge is not. It could be difficult for people to work with outsiders, especially if people who live in the community where this work is accomplished see no material benefit. Rather, they could see funding and resources going to those who already have significant privileges. Under these circumstances, providing more focus on local needs and perspectives from local observations has an important role in framing the questions that are asked. Can funding agencies and science, scientists defer their control over research goals? This is an essential question. The federal, question. the federal agencies that oversee the trust responsibility of Native American tribes since their inception have not served people so much as managed natural resources for extraction permits. People in Native communities struggled during the COVID-19 pandemic to provide adequate care from a system chronically deficient at meeting the needs of Native people in normal times. And estimates are that healthcare funding is half of what is required for the current patient care. But while Navajo people were occupied with keeping communities safe, the Bureau of Land Management and the Bureau of Indian Affairs had an online virtual, a virtual online consultation with tribes about new oil leases near Chaco Canyon National Historic Park in New Mexico. And these types of online listening sessions have become a common practice, despite the lack of broadband access in rural areas. Tribal participants have described these consultations as too much and too little because of the extra demands on time for limited staff and the limited effect their comments are likely to have. Climate change adaptation could guide our actions toward a shared future. However, it will take a concerted effort for the rights of the marginalized to be recognized and for their engagement to be more meaningful. The current path is limit, limited and only provides changes at the margins. It won't undo the underlying structures that will lead to increasing poverty and marginalization without a shared goal that's framed in justice and fairness. Tribal consultation guidelines are ambiguous and they change with administrations so despite efforts to clarify and strengthen consultation policy, the weight of a consultation could still be no more than a letter of notification. Tribal officials are unlikely to have the same kind of resources to adequately weigh decisions or estimate the consequences of development or relocation plans. The information available that a federal agency might share, however, could be accessed by those with financial and technical resources and science staff. There may be a renewed interest in nuclear energy and uranium mining, as well as a growing interest in mining for, for lithium and copper. And under these circumstances, it's doubtful that the rights of indigenous people to free prior and informed consent alone will lead to decision-making that is equally informed. Despite broad efforts to include the voices of indigenous people, the legacy of colonialism's complexity are underestimated. A proactive climate change adaptation policy is needed that recognizes the current and growing inequities and enables a collective future for everyone. This will require that we use our hearts and heads together and recognize human rights and work towards an adaptive capacity to shape a future where different cultures and forms of knowledge and experiences are acknowledged, all acknowledged as necessary contributions to a world in which we can all belong. Thank you. So now I'd like to invite Rebecca up for her, for her comments. I'm looking forward to them. Good afternoon. I am so honored to be here and thank you so much, Dr. Margaret Red Steer, my awesome friend and colleague for giving us two 
amazing lectures yesterday and today, the detail and the impacts that you describe are just so important to be noted publicly, but it's very, very hard to marshal that level of detail that you have across those sectors. So that's a true accomplishment. I want to thank the members of the Tanner Committee and the Mahindra Humanities Center for realizing and recognizing how important it is to include all of these voices. Um, thank you to the amazing faculty here. Dr. Joseph Gahn is a, a tremendous um, force for healing and inspiring us all with your work. Thank you for that amazing introduction and for everything you're doing. And, for Professor Deloria and the amazing faculty of this institution. It's such an honor to be here. So I have the honor of speaking to several themes in the paper today about these structural challenges. And I want to commend Dr. Redsteer for recognizing that there are kind of hidden links between the policies and practices that govern climate dialogues and climate action for governments and for scientists and for indigenous peoples. And to actually bring all of those together and to look at how they impact each other is what I want to engage. In the paper that, that Margaret just delivered today, there are three essential points that come out of the, and you, and you spoke to, to all of these, but I want to emphasize them again. First of all, that this, this theme that we call the dialogue on climate change, which is national and local, and it's international and global, um, is defining what the future risks are in a way that is politically palatable, because that gets us through these big economic struggles that we have, um, but it's not conducive to what you have framed as climate change mitigation and adaptation. Um, so why is that? You point out that it fosters the pathway of least resistance. We don't have to think too hard if it's in the future. And it magnifies the existing inequality. And how do we even know what those inequalities are if we're not gathering the data to make that visible and having that level of conversation? The second one is what you theme as mainstreaming climate action, right? Because we don't just want to dialogue, we want to put this into action. But if we mainstream that action, then we elevate the existing voices and power structures, and then we minimize the marginalized communities and those historic impacts that you have talked about yesterday and today. So we don't enfold that into the action part of it. That was the past, the future risks. Uh, we can think about that later. So the mainstreaming thing keeps us in our comfort zone, I think. So we don't have to do too much, but we can call that action. And I would say that both of those levels of problem you have spoken to very elegantly, and I'll describe those as distributional t forms of inequality that we're not engaging and that will come back to haunt us. The third point that you make is the one that I personally resonate with with my work as a legal scholar. And so Dr. Redsteer argues that without a true participatory justice framework for climate action, that includes recognition of human rights and laws, the rhetoric around climate change might be interpreted by native nations as a threat to their sovereignty. So as sovereigns, they're not totally on board with some of the things that maybe other communities would find necessary for mitigation and adaptation of climate change. And I think you illustrated that very, very well. That sets up a dichotomy of interests which we're, we're framing between, in some cases, the interests of, of uh, cultural traditional forms of the community, for example, that oppose new forms of mineral exploration. You mentioned the dialogue around uranium mining has had catastrophic impacts on tribal lands, waters, and health. And yet now it's a major sector of green energy under the Biden administration's plan. So what do we do with that? To my knowledge, there's only one processing mill, and that is in Utah, adjacent to the Navajo Nation and the Ute 
people's lands. And that's where all of this waste is going. So that's the environmental justice part of green energy that your paper is implicating. And what do we do with that given the economics? Because I think 25% of the recoverable uranium is on the Navajo Nation, which currently has a law banning it. But we don't know what the future holds and how that risk is going to be calculated. So I want to talk to the theme that came up last night about transformative change. So if we don't just want this change around the margins, if we really want, who wants transformative change? <laughs> OK, let's go there. So what do we need to do to make that happen? And I want to um, offer the idea that there are four key areas that we might think about collectively um, and get into a conversation. First of all, I think it's necessary to understand the global and national politics about climate change, how that politics implicates the interests of federally recognized indigenous nations and governments in the United States, and also other indigenous peoples in this country and other countries. So if we think holistically about indigenous peoples, what are the politics and how does it affect those two different groups? Um, and I'm going to talk about that as the challenges of governance. And I think governance is, is a big theme right now in the world, so it, we can't be afraid to go there. Um, second is to understand how our current rights framework, and so this is the backbone of federal law and policy, that rights framework doesn't necessarily recognize the human rights construct of indigenous autonomy, both political and cultural, which is the right of self-determination. And the right of self-determination is now embedded in international policy in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That is a moral right. It's also a political right of all peoples. And it's a legal right. We have a Self-Determination Act in the United States that dates back to like 1974. What does that mean? And what's the international equivalent? So that right structure is what links up to justice because it's, it's situated in indigenous law, in domestic law, and in international law around the theme of justice and that autonomy right. So that's rights and justice. The third one is to understand the interface between climate risk and data sovereignty. And I'm working actively on indigenous data sovereignty. And your paper brought up so many important themes um, because how we calculate risk is really how we're following the data and what types of interpretations we're giving to that data. And finally, and this is the most, this one's the least concrete, I should say. I think we have to appreciate how indigenous futures, if I can use that term, are modeled on a different form of knowledge and epistemology, which you very, very accurately describe in your paper. Um, and that framework, which we were discussing as quote unquote resilience, and I, I don't have a problem with resilience. I, I know it's contested, but sustainability was contested. And hey, I only speak English, so you know we're, we have to use some words. So resilience, um, you know, I mean, to me, it's it's really talking about, and, and you point out the the ways in which um, indigenous peoples have to maintain the values and the relationships that they've had with respect to their land and their water and the pe the communities that surround them and the the land the so-called land dispute on the Hopi and Navajo reservations I think was one of the um, the most egregious human rights violations of all time in this country and I think people don't appreciate it because it was on native land and it was styled as a fight between two tribal governments but it really went much deeper than that that's the thing that we need to engage at that level of value. OK, and I can't, I can't do that justice in like 10 minutes, OK? So I, I just have to talk about each of those themes and then maybe you know, offer some words forward, and we can have our dialogue with the audience. And, and it, somebody has to wave at me if I go too long, because I want to hear what the audience has to think. OK. So on the theme of governance, on the theme of governance, here, I want to talk about how sovereignty 
interfaces with climate change. That is one of the big problems globally, right? Because all of the sovereign nation states have to come together in an international treaty to agree to even recognize that there's a problem, which they did with the UN Climate the Framework Convention. So even the US recognized that in 1992. But are they gonna agree to binding targets for emissions or even are they gonna agree collectively on what we've been styling as the risks? Are they in the future? Is it happening now? What do we have to do to mitigate that? No, they don't agree. They meet every year and by the end of the proceedings, all you can see is all of the struggles for who is gonna be right and what politics is gonna be palatable in each of these nations to make it happen. So sovereignty is hugely important and we haven't resolved it at the international level. With respect to the US position, I think our policy is always to not sign on to binding international instruments. We sign on in principle to things like the Convention on Biological Diversity. We sign on in principle, but we don't do anything to make anything happen. And we rely on the market to generate the solutions. So if you look at the most recent Biden administrations, you know, kind of where they're putting these incentives, it is on renewable energy again. Um, but again, these are kind of local market-based solutions in many cases. So we're not looking structurally at what is happening. Um, where do native nations fit into this? The federally recognized tribal governments, they fit right into the US government's sovereignty, which is a very powerful world actor. And that is why when the Navajo Nation bought the coal mine, they actually, as a tribal government, have the power to do that. They have the power to sell it internationally. They have the power to use the market, which is a global market, to advance their interests, and as long as it aligns with the U.S. interests, that is, that is a huge benefit of tribal governance. Um, the sovereignty that belongs to indigenous communities, though, dates from time immemorial. And so in the cultural construction of sovereignty, it, it is definitely limited by these rights and duties and responsibilities. And I think Oren Lyons, um, the faith keeper of the Onondaga people of the Haudenosaunee Nation, he's given a number of really moving lectures. And so he talks about that and other Native nations speak of that too, that concept of thinking for seven generations ahead. But, but that is a principle of constraint, right? That you can't do things in the short term that actually cut off the rights of the future generations and also there's that idea that the ancestral connections give a repository of value that is what allowed you to be here. So the gift of accepting your life, that was your ancestor's commitment and that is your commitment into the future and things don't go well for communities who forget that original instruction. And there, there are many, many themes to that. Now, that can be understood in a simplistic way. It can be understood in an oppositional way. The traditionalists don't like the market people. Or you could think, given all of the historic circumstances, that you actually have to have huge respect for political and cultural sovereignty and see those local disputes as an example of the global disputes and be able to engage both sides of that value equation. And that is the position that I think I prefer to take, is to not look at it simplistically, to say we have to think of all of that as we decide how to repair the past. Um, so the second theme is, is really this idea of the frameworks of rights and justice. Um, and I, I'm gonna do a little segue to the Colorado River case, which you brought up in your comments. That is an example of the 1922 compact and the thinking that only the seven states matter and they can divide the whole watershed into an upper basin and a lower basin and they can imagine how much water is gonna come into that river and then they could just carve it up. And somehow 100 years later, we're only getting half of the water and 
the states are different now than they were in 1922? And what about the tribal governments? There was like one article in the 1922 compact that says we, we don't want to get in the federal government's business with the tribes. This is about our rights, states' rights, and, and we're not even going to talk about those people. What about Mexico? They were an observer, but they didn't actually get any water rights until the 1944 treaty. <clears throat> so there isn't a history of inclusion, and now we have a massive crisis on the Colorado River. We have all of these agricultural users. We have California saying priority rights. Well, what about California's history with native people? I think probably everybody in the room knows what kind of history that was. Even the governor of California has admitted to that history, a history of genocide and dispossession. That's why LA got tribal water rights as LA's water rights. It's a very ugly history. Should we undo that? and go back to a principle. How are we gonna resolve that? Right now they're talking about what is the rights framework? What's the justice framework? So as we get into that, we get into this conversation of environmental justice. And for tribal governments in the United States, that was a huge, a huge discussion in the 1990s when we looked at the legacy of uranium mining, of coal mining, the waste, the pollution, and tribal governments couldn't even set their own environmental standards until those pollution control sta statutes were amended to give them the right to be treated as states and set water quality standards, air quality standards. That was a huge win in environmental justice. The second generation of that is climate justice. What is the position of indigenous peoples globally in the discussion of climate change? And they are represented in their nation state capacity, they're represented by their nation states, but their own interests are represented by non-governmental organizations, which are collectives, which talk about the human rights framing. They're not recognized as epistemic communities. And that is an omission. I think that started to be corrected in Glasgow. Some of the statements that were made there they are definitely epistemic communities. There is a different way of those land-based peoples, and it's been acknowledged, right, in the international climate assessment, wasn't it 2019, the terrestrial one, where they actually said indigenous peoples are less than 5% of the world's population. They inhabit 25% about of the Earth's surface, and on that 25%, 80% of the global biodiversity is on those lands. So there is a connection, and that's what the discussions at Glasgow were featuring. So that part of sort of the, the climate justice conversation, I think we need to engage on different levels. And in my other work, I've, I've advanced the idea of this quality of environmental self-determination because indigenous peoples are place-based. And the right of self-determination is not only expressed politically, it's expressed culturally. So there is the idea that in the UN Declaration, indigenous people have a relationship with all of their traditional territories, not just their trust reservation. That's a little part of what's left. The traditional territory is still there. Sometimes there's an artificial border, the US-Mexico border, the Canada-US border, border, the Arizona-New Mexico border, the Arizona-California border, those are all artificial borders. The people are situated on the territory and the waters go with those territories. So the understanding that, that you were describing about traditional ecological, environmental knowledge, whatever, it's situated in that construction of territory. And that is recognized in treaties. So there is a legal basis for that. And it's recognized in international human rights law as Article 25 of the UN Declaration describes the spiritual relationship that indigenous peoples have with their ancestral lands, territories, waters, seas, and their duty to safeguard that for the future generations. That's Article 25. There's no other comparable human rights provision that talks about spiritual rights because it's different than religious rights. The third category, climate risk and data sovereignty, and I'm just highlighting these themes, 
Um, that struck me as a hugely important part of your paper and something that we can actually take action on in the current moment. So your points about the lack of data because these, these lands are remote, so the, the NOAA and agencies like that that collect data, they're not collecting it from a lot of these landscapes, right? So we actually don't know what the land is experiencing unless we hear from you or a knowledge keeper in those communities. We don't know what the land and the water and the species are experiencing. Um, so proponents of indigenous data sovereignty, Dr. Maggie Walter, um, my colleague at U of A, Dr. Stephanie Carroll, they will say that the use of data is the biggest form of sort of economy. There's a data economy right now, right? The discussion over big data and digital data and who houses it and what uses are made of it. So that's a huge discussion. From a perspective of indigenous data sovereignty, much of the data that we need is housed in all of these different archives and all of these different studies. It has all been generated using the questions that come from external constituents wanting to get this information. And you discuss so well how that is an extractive process and has been since the colonial explorations from Europe did that, the Lewis and Clark expedition did that, right? They cataloged all this stuff, they extracted all of this knowledge and then they used it for their own political purposes. But there's tons of this information in repositories all over the world, in Europe and in the United States. So the data exists in all of these places. But the current studies are also generated largely externally. And I think there's some effort to change that right now. There are a lot of grants that are being released and a lot of them have like a fast track, get your proposal in in 30 to 60 days, work with tribal colleges and communities. The, the capacity on that end to actually get one of those grants, to write it up, to understand how to frame the questions, it, it's daunting. So there's a will to do it, but the structure doesn't admit that. We can work on that one. We can work on that one together. I would say that is one place to go. If the questions come from the community, and that's why I love um, Dr. Gon's work, that framework of the questions coming from the community, getting all of the different people in the room around what are the issues, how do we understand this, and what outcomes do we want for the community? That is hugely important, and it looks different in different regions. So I, I wanna say that you will have a lot of fans supporting that, that idea, and the area of climate change is, is very important. The other part of that is the, how do we mainstream T, ITEK into, ah, that was a scary thought. So again, proponents of indigenous data sovereignty would say, no, don't pick and choose and take these little things and then mainstream it into there. And the gatekeepers of the knowledge need to be the true gatekeepers. And so we can't assume that the structural form, because that was what went wrong in the energy development thing. You wanna sign this lease? Here, sign this lease. Do you even have the authority over those lands or maybe they belong to a clan, right? Maybe they're not even available to be leased. Those were the questions that were not asked with energy development. They have to be asked right now and, and data sovereignty is one mechanism to get into who are the right people to be asking about that. Um, the conversation about Epistemic injustice is what I want to engage because that came up so well in the commentary. So Miranda Fricker's work in philosophy talking about epistemic injustice, these are the hidden forms that underlie that. The hermeneutical part of injustice, what categories do we have? The categories that we are making are made without consultation with indigenous peoples and that's why you can be extractive. The categories do not fit the communities. Testimonial injustice, who do we find credible to give the information that we want for the purposes that we want it? If you're doing a climate assessment, you better have a bunch of initials after your name and have some good you know, backing for it. And maybe your institution says you can do it. Maybe your institution says, nope, we need you to be teaching 101 to 500 people. You know, so it, that's the area that we're in. Right, and all of that is hidden 
But there's such a small pool of people, I'm willing to say you're one of one. I'm like, I don't, even, I don't even know anybody who does all of the things that you do with science, with community, and all of that. So that's what we're looking at there. And, and you made it all visible. Once it's visible, we have to engage those categorical um, parts of, of exclusion. They're, they're no longer with us. But the good part about that is that we need new categories if we're gonna have transformative change. So this can all be very positive. So that is the part of indigenous epistemologies and indigenous futures. That is what I am working on in my own research. So these are just some, some thoughts. But I think that you have demonstrated very well that indigenous peoples are not just citizens slash stakeholders. And when you go into public lands and you're a stakeholder, then it looks different than if you are a steward, a collaborative manager, a partner, because those are the territories of your people, regardless of whether they're currently in the reservation boundary or not. That is still, so I believe in looking at territory and the construction of that. I think the, the Coast Salish people are doing a brilliant job because they straddle US Canada and they, they're just claiming their territory and then they're inviting the US and Canada to talk to them about what that territory needs. And I think that is a, a productive strategy. So the idea that um, knowledge is, is local, that it's situated, that there are different forms of holding, it goes against this idea of scientific truth. And that's why a lot of people, I think really well many people, they think indigenous knowledge is so cool, but is it right? Is it true? How would we know if tribe A says this and tribe B says that, then somebody doesn't know what they're doing and maybe it's not. And so those are the problems that I think you show very, very well that indigenous knowledge, it is, it's local and it's associated with different things, agriculture, astronomy, fisheries management, it's associated with different things and there's no one truth but there is a community, a knowledge community that has lived in place so long that they know the properties, the characteristics, the way that things move, and the dangers and the risks. And those are different from place to place. I have not heard indigenous knowledge keepers talk about, is that true? I don't know, I don't really. When they all get together from different places, they start talking about, yes, that is the way things work. Let me tell you how it is here. And then somebody else says, ha ha, that's so interesting. Let me tell you how it is here. And that enhances the knowledge base because then you realize that that, that, that search for the truth is just fictional. That's not the way the universe works. So um, the, the last thing that I wanna say, there's so much that I wanna say and I can't say, but I want to say that where I end up with all of this is where you end up, that there is an incredible need to view justice as a healing process, to not be afraid to acknowledge the past, to see what we're doing right now as we are creating the future. But if we don't have an idea of the future that we would like to be creating, then we are very dangerous instruments on a course because of what is happening right now. So that intersection of healing in, in law and transformation, that is the essence of justice. And I wanna say here that the, the, that's why I appreciate Dr. Gaunt's work, and he should probably be giving this commentary, because what healing is for native communities that, that I work with and that I belong to is it's complicated because there is that dimension which we would describe as a spiritual dimension of that, which is the way that you live in a right relationship with the community, with the family, with the, the land that you're on, with all of this. There's a right way to do that, but it's very hard to maintain that because of the material struggles that we're in. And so the underfunding, the health, the pandemic exacerbated that, right? Because there were so many crises, so many deaths in really small communities that that fabric that is very 
it's, it's very important, but it can get frayed in, in ways that are, it makes it hard then to actually focus on that ideal form of what you need to keep in a balance. So the, I guess the, the short way to say that is that there's a daily material struggle. And if you're in the daily material struggle, it's pretty ugly sometimes, and you don't carry a spirit of hope out of that in many days. But there's also a spirit of hope and love and knowing that once things are done in the right way, there's so many things that we have in common. I don't know a lot of you, but I bet if we sat down at a table and started to talk about who we are, where we come from, who we know, what we think, we would find so many beautiful things to honor in each other. And it is that spirit that you just say, I love the community that I live in the global community, the local community, and that coming together across knowledges and experiences and not being afraid to acknowledge the hard truths of what has happened or to make repair in the ways that need to be effectuated. That is really what the planet needs and that is what we need. And I think that was the lesson of what has happened in the last four years of this very strange time. So that is what I have to say. Thank you so much for the paper. And please, Margaret, come up, offer some words if I have misstated anything or anything else needs to be said, and then we will talk to the audience. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciated your comments. I really don't even know what to say except thank you so much for being here and thank you so much for your thoughts. They're so, um, so insightful. It's gonna give me a lot to think about and consider going forward. Thank you. Audience, what do you think? <laughs> Don't be shy. Uh, hi, I'm, is this on? Yeah. Hi, I'm Susie Clark, as you well know, <laughs> director of the Mahindra Humanities Center, and I want to thank uh, you, Margaret, for uh, your second beautiful lecture, uh, and also Rebecca for your comments. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to come back to uh, what you said, Margaret, about um, uh, desperately trying to use the present tense and being forced, as it were, into the future tense. And I just wonder if you could speak a little bit more about your experience uh, of working in the government as to uh, how much of a role you were able to play in asking the kinds of questions you wanted to ask and if there were any other struggles that you could, if, if there are stories you can share with us, uh, what, what they were. like. How much were you able to, how, how free were you to be able to pursue the questions you wanted to pursue uh, beyond things like you know, the present or the future tense? In some ways, I think I was very lucky. I had some people in, in administrative offices, at least initially, that were very supportive of what I was doing. Um, but it was very difficult to get things published. And there were some people in the review process, I would say, that just, they would refuse to sign off on my papers. I'll just put it that way. I've had, I had yelling matches with people who told me climate change had nothing to do with people. <laughs> so, it was a continuous struggle and very stressful. And during the time that, that I worked with Rebecca on the 2013 technical report for the National Climate Assessment, it was very stressful because I knew that everything I spoke about was going to be given a lot of scrutiny. Because anything that is seen as critical 
of a federal policy in any way is not acceptable for a federal scientist to, to discuss in a paper. In climate change, even though it was the Obama administration and we could actually talk about it, um, the way the government was being reorganized was that the people who were working in climate were being swallowed up in bigger and bigger sections of the agency that were all focused on oil and minerals. And so everybody that was overseeing us was really invested in like how we can assess the North Slope of Alaska and things like that. So what in hindsight I learned was that it was okay for me to talk about climate change as long as I really didn't connect it back to some of the sources of climate change, <laughs> if that makes sense. If it's a paleo study, that would be fine. If it's a study where communities who are marginalized, who haven't been subject to fair governmental policies, who are um, facing the impacts from climate change, that's a whole different matter. And so uh, in my publications, I knew a lot of the people in the community would not know or read journal publications anyway so I got permission to, to make a video about our research and our research findings and what some of the community responses were. And it was approved during the Obama administration, but then by the time we finalized it, Trump was in office. And it had uh, a video pan of an oil refinery in it, which people objected to, and I refused to take out. And as a result, I got a phone call the day after it was released telling me I would no longer have any research funding. So getting published is very stressful. Talking in public is very stressful. Um, during the Trump administration, another thing is at, even at scientific meetings, we weren't given permission to go to science meetings unless we were gonna talk about border security infrastructure by meaning, meaning infrastructure, meaning the border wall, or um, conservation in the spirit of Teddy Roosevelt. Those were the three themes that we were allowed to speak about as scientists if we were gonna go to a meeting. So people were just like going along, being very creative about how they could say, well, infrastructure, Margaret, you can still go to the meeting. Just say that the dunes are covering the border wall, which they eventually did do, by the way. I have pictures of it, but anyway. Um, so um, I really fear for climate scientists and government scientists in general and their ability to speak publicly and frankly about the problems that we face. And it's gonna be a barrier, not just for climate change, but for other, other really serious science issues that we're facing. So I guess I'll end there because I think that's hopefully enough of a, of a perspective, but it really has informed a lot about what I understand about how agencies operate because I don't th really think there was anybody who really intentionally went after me. I think it was all about where resources and priorities were gonna go and they weren't gonna go to me. And it was about not wanting to make waves, being really afraid that if this scientist over here was to say something about indigenous people being harmed by climate change, how is Trump gonna see the Navajo generating station and his push to keep coal-fired power plants operating? And I will say one more thing, I have to say one more thing. I was actually disinvited to a meeting too. So I was invited to a climate change meeting in New Mexico, there was a high level meeting with state officials. And I said, well, you know, I'm gonna to have to get approval to come. And they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Go ahead, ask for approval. And then they called me back the next day and said, I'm sorry, but we're gonna to have to disinvite you <laughs> because they got pressure not to invite me. Um, and it was because of the coal-fired power plant issue.
So um, learning a lot from academia and glad to be learning different perspectives this way and able to talk a little more freely. Hi, thank you so much for coming and speaking. Um, I am thinking a lot about what you were saying earlier, uh, Professor Tsotsi, about uh, indigenous people's kind of spiritual rights to land. And I couldn't help but think about Oak Flat and the stuff that's happening there right now and all the trouble it's having in the courts. And uh, I recently watched um, the arguments when it uh, appeared in the Ninth Circuit recently. And I remember the lawyers on the Resolution Copper side. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Oak Flat's a sacred area to the Apache people, and uh, Resolution Copper um, is trying to basically uh, uh, subside the whole thing to uh, get uh, access to a very large copper deposit there. And the lawyers were arguing that if you know, Resolution Copper were denied the land transfer from the federal government, that it would be absolutely catastrophic for business, right? And I you know, think a lot about how politically expedient a position like that is, right? Because you know, uh, one of the big buzzwords in politics is jobs and economic development and stuff. And I often think about how the preservation of indigenous land is often uh, kind of put in opposition towards that, right? So when we protect Oak Flat, we're denying jobs, right? Um, thinking very similarly uh, to things on uh, Mauna Kea, for example, in Hawaii, when you know, Native Hawaiians went and protected that area, they were portrayed as being anti-science, right, and also anti-jobs for the construction of the telescopes. So I was wondering what kind of what you both have to say about that and generally how, what the future of protecting indigenous sites, especially in the courts, um, uh, kind of fares in the future. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that question and thank you for noting both of those case studies, Oak Flat and Mauna Kea. I think they're perfect examples of what we're talking about with the dominant society's construction of what is needed. And you're right that the construction of Resolution Copper is that we need to save Arizona's local economy in that area and this copper mine has got everything to do that. But the backstory of that is very concerning because the Apache people did have a treaty that acknowledged that as their territory and that cultural practice cannot go anywhere else. And the process that was used to transfer it was that midnight rider because Congress wouldn't even engage that legislation when it was put in there for like three different times. They would not pass it. So they had to do a rider to a defense bill. The whole process was corrupt. And I, I think America's society needs to view that as a threat to themselves. If you can circumvent all of the environmental laws, all of the political process to benefit a corporation that is gonna collapse that land, use all of the water and pollute it so that you can't live there. And if people think that's the right conduct for the future, that's a problem for all of America. So thank you so much for mentioning that, and, and I commend you. Margaret, I know you've worked a lot on sacred places, and, and that's an example of one that it's so, so specific. There is no other place you can do those ceremonies, none. I guess the only thing I would add to that is when you're looking at the ways that indigenous knowledge is being put forward, that we're going to protect sacred sites and things like that. It's a very uneven treatment, right? When it's, when it's politically expedient and it serves, pol it serves our, the people who want to look good, say, internationally, mm -hmm. then, then perhaps it's gonna go forward as long as there's not a competing inner economic interest. Mm -hmm. But even something as small as a ski resort <laughs> that's, that's getting to the point where it is too warm even for the artificial snow to stay on the ground is somehow preferable to preserving the highest elevation ecosystems in Arizona. That's questionable. That's highly questionable. And it's, you know, it may be great for the skiing economy in Flagstaff every once in a while, but there have been years where the snowmaking runs are the only thing with snow on them. And the snow, the artificial snow, of course, 
treated sewage effluent is not, you know, there are so many chemicals in our wastewater now that treated water is not clean water. It has many, many different kinds of endocrine disruptors and things like that where we're, we don't even know a lot of what the, the environmental harms are to some of what, we, what we're doing to our waters. So in that case, it just seems like such a small step to actually weigh a small economic interest compared to the last part of a high elevation ecosystem with endangered species mm -hmm. and all of these different tribes who hold the place sacred. Mm -hmm. And still the ski resort one. Yeah. So um, we do have to rethink the way law is applied. And I think one of the ways that people are doing it is human rights. Isn't that correct? That is very, very true. And the United States, I think, is going to take a black eye over that in the international sphere. I saw one question that we didn't get to. Do you still want to ask your question? OK, yes. I actually wanted to ask you, because I thought yesterday and today were so rich, what I wanted to ask you about is this idea of, I guess, the how do you get more people to care? There was a survey literally yesterday that said that a lot of people now believe that climate change is happening, but they don't believe that it's human-induced climate change. So what role do we have, I guess, for this sort of empathetic, the, the stories, right, to like have our role and its centrality in what is, ex what is happening uh, just become more recognized? That's a tough one, but I would go right back to the science because we've known that CO2 in the atmosphere is what keeps our atmosphere livable for all of us. And just going back and talking about how long we have known about these physical processes um, is really, I mean, it is really the, the most compelling argument to me, but then I'm a scientist, so maybe Rebecca has a perspective too. <laughs> so from my perspective, I think that people like to imagine that climate change is a natural thing. It's always happened. There was probably an ice age. Some dinosaurs didn't last. <laughs> like, you know, people were not responsible for any of this. But that actually isn't true. In this case, according to the science of every country with great scientists. So how do you navigate what we know to be true about the human contribution that's causing this? And that carries liability and responsibility to do something. That's the call to action. If you just say it's a natural thing and give it five more years and it may change back, then you don't have to worry about doing anything. But if you say, no, we are actually contributing to this crisis that could actually change the way that we live into the future in ways that we do not want, then we have to imagine that we have a different potential future that we do have some ability to navigate. And I think it was Einstein, he actually wrote about the power of imagination in that way, and he linked it to um, memory and perception. And so with indigenous peoples, the memory goes back to time immemorial, those stories. I worked in repatriation issues for a long time, and the narratives were very important to that. They could go back so many generations to events that they shouldn't have been able to go back to in human memory, but they could go back to that. And that was very powerful because that was a situated memory, and the perception of place is different because it carries all of those generations of memory. So the capacity to imagine a different future is with indigenous peoples, it's there. That's why they know what's happening at Mauna Kea. If that happens, our future is going to change. That is one of those places that's an anchor place. How do you get the external society to recognize that situated knowledge which carries ethical con uh, ethical construction of human behavior? And that's what you're asking. And I think the crisis event is what does it. The crisis event is what does it for a lot of people. If there is, they, they all got things together in the pandemic, because they had to, 
But once that goes away, they, it's business as usual if you don't monitor that. So I think it's a great question. Thank you so much. I have just enjoyed hearing from you and being here. And thank you to Margaret. Round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca.